Hi there, I'm James Dapperty and this is Coffee and a Case Note. Team, today what we're going to be speaking about are restraints of trade or post-employment restrictions. What are we talking about? All right, we've got uh, a real estate agency that owns a rent roll. And essentially what that is, is a register of clients who are landlords for whom that real estate agent collects the rent and charges for doing so. Uh, so the rent roll owned by an estate agent in the eastern suburbs of Sydney over your shoulder that way. Now, that rent roll is sold to a purchaser. At about the time that sale is completed, the property manager who administered uh, the rent roll, who did all the work for those landlords, uh, stops being employed by the vendor and starts being employed by the purchaser. Thank you very much, that's fantastic. Stop. Cheers, thank you. No it's, no, it's fabulous, thank you. Stops being employed by the vendor and starts being employed by the purchaser and begins to get to work administering the rent roll on behalf of the purchaser. Now, during this period of employment, let's start that again. At the commencement of this period of employment by the purchaser, our property manager has no written contract. Some years pass and our property manager mentions that uh, if she were to uh, accept the offer of employment from another real estate agent who's nearby and a competitor, then she would possibly take her owners with her. Now at about this time, as you can imagine, the purchaser, the property manager's employer, uh, gets a written contract together and that written contract includes a number of restraints of trade. Forgive me. There's a bit of to and fro with the employment agreement. Uh, you might have seen restraints of trade contracts before. They have cascading clauses that say you're restricted for four years, or if not four, three years, or if not three, two years, etc. Uh, this restraint, there was a bit of negotiation, arrived at a point of three years and arrived at a geographical restriction of within five kilometres of this eastern suburbs estate agency. And what was the restriction? It was you can't go work for a competitor and you can't come and take our clients away. So this was signed up. Right, what happened next was that our property manager was made redundant. The employer uh, terminated the relationship due to redundancy. What happened very shortly afterwards was the property manager accepted an offer of employment from another estate agency within 1.8 kilometers of her former employer. Now just by way of context, our property manager had the same surname uh, as uh, her dad, <laughs> who operated the vendor of this rent roll. Remember the estate agency that originally was collecting all the rent and had these landlord relationships? She had that surname, obviously had a relationship with her dad. And then the new employer, uh, that was a corporation whose sole uh, director is her cousin. So there's a family connection between this original vendor, the property manager, and the contemplated new employer with the purchaser of the rent roll in the middle possibly feeling a little bit miffed. Now, the degree of miffedness uh, was shown with an application made by this purchaser, by this estate agent, to get an injunction stopping the property manager from going and working from her cousin. What an injunction is, as you almost certainly know, is an order of the court uh, generally to stop someone doing something. And the nature of this injunction was for it to happen immediately on an interlocutory basis, which is to say, before final hearing, we want it today, then we can argue about whether it was right in future, that makes sense, but we want it today, immediately. And so you're coming before the judge when you're seeking an interlocutory injunction to say, we want it right now, and we can have an argument about all the facts and figures and details in future, but we want it today in the interim, on an interlocutory basis. And so today we're talking about that interim interlocutory application. Now, if the court's gonna give you that injunction straight away, the court has to be satisfied that there's a serious question to be tried, which is to say the court has to be satisfied that the big long hearing in future, where there'll be all the evidence and all the cross-examination and all the details, that there's a serious argument in favor of the person who wants the injunction. And the second thing the court needs to be satisfied is that the balance of convenience of giving the injunction today, straight away, is in favour of the person who wants it. 
So what our estate agent has to say is, uh, we are going to win the argument that the property manager is in breach of these restraint clauses. There's a serious question that we're going to win. And the estate agent has to say, the balance of convenience is that we should get the injunctions today uh, pending this final hearing that'll happen sometime in future. Now, on the serious question to be tried point, the estate agency wins. In short, uh, the 1.8 kilometre um, uh, uh, location <laughs> of the new employer is within that five kilometre radius. Uh, and so uh, it looks likely that it'll be captured by the restraint clause. And the restraint, particularly the non-solicitation, the idea you can't come and take clients or work for a competitor, due to the surnames and these previous relationships, that was seen to be protecting the legitimate interests of the purchaser. Meaning that uh, the, there was a serious question as to whether the restraints were enforceable, and there was a serious question as to whether the restraints ought to last for that 12 month period. So the estate agent succeeded at that interlocutory point, at that preliminary interim point, at saying, yep, there's a real argument to be had in future, so we want the injunctions today. Now you win that argument, you also have to say the balance of convenience that it is just for us to get the injunctions today, because remember, our employee will be prevented from going to work if the injunction is granted. So the estate agent has to say, look, prevent her from going to work today. It's more just that you do that than you allow her to go to work because we're going to suffer all this damage because she'll go into competition and she'll use her relationships with these owners and and will suffer all this damage. And also, what the court accepted was that our employee was only being paid a salary. So if the injunction was granted today on this interlocutory interim basis, and in the final hearing it turned out that the employee won, and it was wrong and unjust for her to be prevented from working for all this time, then damages could apply for that. And those damages were just the salary she didn't earn. She's not on commission. Uh, the court said, well, Let's give the injunction today, because if we're wrong to give that injunction, if it turns out that the estate agency loses, then all the estate agency has to do is to whip out the calculator, plug in your salary for this amount of time, and justice is done, because you'll get that salary back. And so what the court found, that there were these serious questions about the legitimacy of the restraints and about the length of time of the restraints, and also that the balance of convenience favoured the estate agency, and so, the injunctions were granted on that interim basis with a final hearing, with a final decision on all this stuff looming out in the future. A little bit crunchy, a little bit fiddly, but I hope today's discussion about uh, interim interlocutory relief and some knotty legal issues assisted you in getting a little bit grounded in these sorts of fiddly areas. And I hope you will join me again soon for another coffee and another case note. Cheers. <laughs>